All right, we here we are at lecture two, part one. My father is a native of Watsonville, a city in Southern California, though he spent most of his childhood in Santa Cruz, which was just 20 minutes away and along the coast. His time there would inculcate in him a deep love of beach environments, along with foggy mornings, clam chowder bread bowls, and athletic games, most specifically volleyball, basketball, and baseball. This environment would be the major shaper of his personality until his enlistment in the U.S. Army and his subsequent term that would make him a veteran of the Gulf War, developing in him a sense of discipline, attention to detail, and intensity that he would never lose. As my father, it was only natural that he wanted to share these things with me. We would often make the four-hour drive from our home in Ukiah to visit his family for the weekend. While he was a strict disciplinarian, this level of discipline could only be matched by his gregariousness in times of relaxation and socializing. Many of my favorite memories involved spending time with my extended family, especially my uncle, who is also my godfather. We would visit my cousin as well, and though we were cousins, he was closer to age in my father than he was to me. And sometimes we would visit, quote, his old stomping grounds, as he would say, in Santa Cruz. Anyone native to the area is aware of the cultural focus on the boardwalk. It is a long collection of stores and establishments which run alongside the ocean, connected by, as you'd assume, a boardwalk that allows easy access from the beach. It is associated iconically with a surfer beach boy stereotype and somewhat more generally with Californian beach culture. It contains a wooden roller coaster, restaurants, stores, and arcades of various sorts. Its aesthetic is one common that you see all around California, that of a historic preservation only barely maintained, as though the only thing anyone has done for the last 112 years is to throw a fresh coat of paint onto everything. There is a specific trip that I remember vividly. It was somewhere in late in the afternoon, in the twilight hours. For those, natives, for those not native to the area, the coast is unbelievably beautiful as the sun sets. For meteorolo meteorological reasons I do not understand, the stars appear vividly in the east as the sun starts to cross the horizon, leading you to seeing an orange sky over the ocean, a ring of hazy purple, and then the starry night over the hills. We were with my uncle Samuel, or Sammy as he preferred, and my cousin David. We had decided to finish the evening walking along the boardwalk with the previously mentioned white clam chowder served in fresh bread loaves. My cousin was talking to my dad about a fishing trip he was on, in which he reached his hand out only to catch a seagull dropping, as an example of spectacularly bad luck. It was a funny story and common of the atmosphere my family provided. As we walked along the boardwalk, I remember hearing an intense cacophony of noise as we approached the corner of a building. The noise of bells ringing and electronic buzzers going off. It was an arcade, much like the ones I was familiar with, except much larger. I had previously only known of arcades as attachments to pizza parlors or drinking bars. I asked my father if we could stop, but he declined. We were walking towards the parking lot to leave, and I presumed there was a schedule to keep. It was as we passed by a smaller bay opening beyond the main entrance that I looked in and saw something that would radically change the course of my life. It was two teenagers playing on the MVC2 arcade cabinet. I did not realize it at the time, but they were playing at a competitive level. I had never seen anything like this before. I had played fighting games, no doubt, but to me they were about pressing random buttons on a controller. I had no idea they could be played with this level of precision, speed, or skill. Exasperating this was that, being from a small town, I was still several years behind the modern technology of the times. I was still playing Super Nintendo games as though they were cutting edge, even though now we were into the new millennia. The graphical presentation of the game no doubt added to the effect of wonder. I stood there for a few minutes watching them, never before having something caught my attention so completely. I would heard the word inspired, but it was a meaningless word, at least until that moment. As I turned to leave, I remember a distinct thought I had, a development of a specific desire that I had never felt before in my life. I would not have phrased it this way at the time, but it was clear to me. I wanted to be like them. That is to say, I wanted to be excellent, and I was going to do everything and anything I could to do so. The first method of improvement, emulation. Question one, why is emulation the first method? Inspiration begins with beauty. For everything we desire, there is something beautiful there first that we want to make part of ourselves. This extends even to epistemic subjects. As we first learn of a thing being, and then desiring to know that thing, we see it and we want to know it. This is the start of the desire for excellence, first by seeing excellence in others and then wanting it for ourselves. This movement from being inert to wanting to change is what we call inspiration. You are inspired by the excellence of someone else. From here, we mentioned that all excellence begins in poverty. This is because all desire comes from poverty. You cannot desire something that you think you have. It is not an accident that inspiration is often conflated with a sensation of awe. This is because beauty is awe-inspiring. It is the sensation of recognizing how much greater than you something is, or how much it contains of something that you lack. To recognize that a thing has something you lack, and what you desire is that which is greater than you, 
both of these can only occur after obtaining a necessary first virtue, or at least having the first impulse, that of humility. This is probably one of the most difficult parts of becoming excellent, in that one must recognize how far from excellence they are, not merely for its own sake, but for the sake of seeing beauty in the first place. It's very easy to say these words, but it is only after a deep introspection and acceptance does it become real. Most people can analytically understand they are not capable of something, but the reality of this lack of excellence, that is, that you deserve no respect in your current state, that you deserve no honor for it, that there is something deficient in you, and that you should feel negative emotions for it, that is, feelings of shame and inadequacy. This only comes after making yourself vulnerable and doing psychic violence to yourself, that you put yourself in a position to learn. You will often find people who want to get better quit the moment they feel insulted or their otherwise delicate sensibilities disturbed. They cannot become excellent because they think they are already fine. This is the split between saying the words and then actually living them. People are very good at saying words and someone saying, I know I am bad at this, but then being too sensitive to do what is necessary to change speaks to a very different internal reality. The intellectual acknowledgement of inadequacy does not translate to an actual recognition of it. This is why it is so common for many experts to speak of a humbling experience in their past, where they remember a key moment that they realized just how much of an amateur they really were. This is why we call it humiliation, because it aptly humiliates you. It reveals to you how unprepared you are. This is also why you find jaded people, pessimistic people, or the slothful to be a product of pride. It is impossible to be inspired by something if you think you are better than it, because anything excellent it has, you already possess. It is little wonder that philosophical schools that are pessimistic also have a warped or no sense of aesthetics. How can you find beauty if you place yourself above everything in judgment? Though in their case, they tend to find no meaning in anything at all for the same reasons. That as an aside, this becomes a quick and fast way to root out issues of pride. If you find yourself incapable of seeing beauty in things, or more accurately, incapable of wanting to see beauty in things, and incapable of allowing beautiful things to inspire you, you can use this as a starting point for introspection on figuring out where the pride is. It can often seem paradoxical why the most proud people are also the most useless, since it seems intuitive to think that the most proud are those who are most accomplished, but with the understanding of the nature of excellence as beginning in humility, it should now be more clear. But this brings us back to the original question. Why is emulation the first method? It is because of all the ways to improve, emulation is closest to what makes us desire excellence in the first place. Question two, what is emulation? Emulation is when we find someone of great expertise and then do as they do, or I should say, we attempt to do as they do. Now, like before, we have to break this down and unpack it, since there are really two questions that directly follow from it. The first being, how to identify the masters? And the second being, why does it work? Question three, how do we identify the masters? It is this specific element that ends up being the problem for most people. They simply don't know how to identify who they should listen to. In many ways, this is going to be the obvious problem. In most things, the knowledge to understand what is excellent is the same knowledge you would need to be excellent. If you aren't excellent, there's no reason you can know who is worth listening to. However, this is not exactly correct. If one starts from the premise that he can only identify a master by identifying the master's knowledge and comparing it to what he thinks is correct knowledge, then you are stuck at an impasse since it is a circular loop that no one can jump onto. The loop being, you must know what is excellent to find a master, but you must find a master to know what is excellent. Rather, by evaluating someone's competency in terms of outcomes, that is, outcomes as defined by the end of the activity, you are able to identify correctly someone's competency solely by understanding the proper end of the activity itself. You have thus introduced an objective measure to judge others by. For instance, one may not know what it takes to be an excellent basketball player, but knowing the end of the activity of basketball is to win a game, then you can competently judge that someone is excellent by their repeated winning. Or a master sculptor can be identified by his continued production of works of beauty. This is, of course, a very natural way of doing things, since you are only looking for an expert because you desire to be good and at the activity, and thus you already know what the activity is about in a very basic sense. Now where do most people go wrong? It really comes from a few specific errors. The first is the assumption that they can deduce, upon hearing arguments or other observations, who the true expert is. For the reasons we listed, this is impossible. But even before that, this is the error of pride, or a lack of humility, since it fundamentally disbelieves in the expertise in the first place. If someone was capable of having a meaningful grasp of something without any sort of serious investment of effort, then there would be no need to identify an expert in the first place, since there would be no such expertise. This is quite common with the prevalence of the internet, where people think merely having access to information means they can competently parse it. It is the problem of knowing about something versus knowing of something. Because we can read the words and associate ideas with them, people think they understand the information in an authentic way. 
This prevents them from ever improving past this point, since they have already made up their mind about what being excellent entails in some specific subject. The second specific error here is anytime people want to study something which does not have objective measurements, they tend to select things based on what appeals to them, rather than find any sort of meaningful standard. For us, what we might call a popular standard. Notice I said popular standard, since the lack of objective outcomes to identify the specific expertise lends itself to activities that themselves are low expertise activities. It does not help that we also live in a time where institutions which are meant to be the defenders of these popular standards are mostly subversive. In this case, the only real options are to develop more practical judgment to be able to recognize inherently poor information, or to bite the proverbial bullet and trust the popular opinion. The first solution is not something you can actively work at, but must come with life experience, and thus time. So it resolves to waiting to learn about the activity. The second solution can have its risk tempered by not committing fully to the ideas and knowledge you find until you can confirm it in some other way. This is proper to these subjects since being rendered by judgments, one must have good judgment that only comes about by time to understand it. This is why so many subjects are not fit for the young. They simply have no means by which to properly understand something. As the one remedy, which is time, they do not have yet enough. Question 4. Why does emulation work? The essence of emulation is most basically to do without knowing why. This ends up being a way of developing experience with an activity while avoiding the impossible expertise loop. Because all activities must be done through will, and the will follows the intellect, which beholds the why, without expertise, you cannot supply a meaningful why on your own. But through emulation, the why is replaced entirely with, because he did it, or because he did it this way. The he being the master or the expert that you are emulating. Thus, you are able to fully circumvent the necessity of knowledge at the start. There are other practical benefits as well. While we have only talked about the first method, the other methods are also involved in this, being both intellectual study and practical training. Since you are seeking to emulate someone who has already succeeded, it is reasonable to suspect that his training and his resources of study are effective at what they do. Since the start of anything is connected to its end, it is appropriate that there is a resonance between the first method and the last method, the last method being the ultimate synthesis of the three basic methods, that of master and student. In many ways, emulation is exactly half of the master and student relationship, in which you submit yourself to someone as a master, follow his example, study as he studied, and practice as he practiced. However, there is one key difference that I will leave unsaid until the last lecture, because it is the ultimate differentiation between the knowledge of how to become excellent and the actual practice of it. This will be the core subject of the fifth lecture. As to the specific mechanics of emulation, there are three essential things happening. The first is that we are trying to practically experience their technical excellence. We do not have the wisdom necessary to understand why they do what they do, but we gain a real and particular knowledge if we can at least recreate what they do ourselves. The second is that we gain a more general type of knowledge by adopting their overall strategy. Most activities have a particular understanding and then a more general understanding, and by emulating a master we can often bootstrap our own understanding off of theirs, since we can always place the context of our actions within whatever their greater context is. The third is that we immunize ourselves against misunderstandings of unstable systems. It is very common that small habits have a large impact on the outcome of complicated tasks. Through emulation, we can often pick up the habits unknowingly, thus habituate them naturally. This is not a universal law, but it is useful when it occurs. Question 5. How much should we emulate? Everything you can. This is another common stumbling block, since many might suspect emulation means to just sort of do what they do, or to, in general, do what they do. Or more commonly still, adapt what they do to work for you, a phrase you might be familiar with. The problem with this is that you are emulating them because you don't know what works for you. Your judgment is already faulty or lacking, and interpreting them through the lens of your own making is only going to introduce the already present failure. The goal is to emulate them to the tiniest detail possible. Of course, one might call to mind the absurd examples of people copying some professional's personal idiosyncrasies, the carrying of odd curios or superstitions, like adopting a rabbit's foot because a champion you know carries one as well. This is meant to be funny when it occurs because it's obviously irrelevant to their performance or their excellence. Yet there is a kernel of truth here. With any given virtue, there is an excess and a deficiency. Yet. While the correct amount of the substantive virtue resides in between them, it does not reside in the middle. The virtue usually lies much closer to one extreme than the other. An easy example of this is to understand the virtue of generosity, where the excess is giving away so much that you cannot fulfill your own duties, while the deficiency is being purely stingy in that you never give anyone anything. Proper generosity is not in some median position. 
it is in fact much closer to the gross liberality than it is to stinginess. In this same way, obsessively mimicking someone to the point of superstition is much closer to the proper virtue of emulation than reinterpreting everything someone does to your personal desires. This ends the explanation of emulation. Tomorrow we will discuss the second method, which is that of intellectual study. Any questions? So it is much more virtuous to copy someone for the sake of emulation than it is to take aspects of what they do and reinterpret it to or make ourselves better. Um, essentially, yes. So you often find people who are really good at something, right? They'll do that, right? They'll see something that someone else does, like another professional, another, you know, another, another player or another writer, you know, something, something like that, another artist, you know, another scientist. That was, that was huge, right? And you'll take something of them and you'll sort of just add it on to you, right? Like in an eclectic sense. But that's something that someone who's already proficient at it can do. For someone who's trying to become excellent, who's trying to get up there, they can't really do that. Because really, you have no means by which to judge what you should take from them and what you shouldn't. So what ends up happening is that all you really do is just sort of introduce all your own bad habits that you already had. There might be some sort of marginal improvement, but it's not going to actually help you become more excellent in, in a serious way. Because, as I said, you're, you're still just stuck within your own sort of badness, your own bad ability. And, and that's sort of the important part. And, of course, this is why Aristotle talks about it, right? Having a good master is the most important thing because you have no means by which to figure out, oh, is my master BSing me? Because you're, it, it, there's kind of this, it's kind of this, you know, again, there's another paradox here where you have no means to know if your master is misleading you. But if you start questioning your master, even if he's a bad one, you're never going to become excellent. Do you see what I'm saying? And so the, <laughs> there's something, there's something, like there's this sort of hilarious paradox where even if the person you're emulating is misleading you, you, you're just sort of already sort of being led down the wrong path and then questioning them is only going to keep it there. Like you're not going to be able to recorrect yourself. And so this is why for Aristotle, there simply is no, there is no secondary quality. It's just you need a good teacher. <laughs> because if he's a good teacher and you question him, you're not going to learn. And if he's a bad teacher and you question him, you're not going to learn. But the thing is the bad teacher, even if you don't question him, you're still not going to learn because he's a bad teacher. Yeah, like I said, there's sort of something hilarious there to that. And so, but this is what emulation is, right? And of course, this was, as I went over in the first part, this was the entire first part of the thing I, I, I just, you know, talked about, was that you need to find these objective outcomes to help you identify who, who's good at it, who's, a good te who's someone good to emulate. And so you have this sort of situation where you just have to look at the outcome. If the person's doing it well, according to the activity itself, then you can figure, then, you know, then that's sort of your good choice there. You don't ever want to follow someone because they're potentially good at something. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, is emulation at all possible in a good way with fictional characters or historical figures, which may have some exaggerated descriptions? So it's hard to say with some of that stuff because exaggerated descriptions themselves are sort of uh, inherently self-destructive. You're trying to understand an activity most, most true and even an exaggeration is itself a movement away from what actually is there. And so, because this is sort of that idea that like, it's sort of a false idea that like, oh, if you aim, you know, oh, aim, aim for the moon, you hit the stars, you know, that, that kind of funny thing people say, it's, you're not aiming above the mark and then hitting it. That doesn't, that's not how this works when you're trying to understand something in, in a competent way. There's the competent way of understanding it. And then everything else is just sort of a falsehood. And so you have to be really careful because, uh, you know, you'll find people who do that. They'll, they'll make changes to try to achieve something that never actually happened and, in, and it ultimately ends up becoming an impossible task and they end up adopting self-destructive habits out of it. So you have to be really careful with that. And fictional characters and historical figures, well, fictional characters, we have to be careful here because I don't, this is so, sort of a digression, but it calls into the question of art since all fictional characters are meant to serve the greater narrative which is ultimately the vehicle for the theme, which is some belief the creator wants to impart on you through experience, right? Metaphysically speaking. And so we have to sort of be careful here because fictional characters are by their nature, not their own existence and, aim, and not aimed at anything. Uh, you know, you, you sort of have to be careful there with that. And, 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 sort, and, 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 you know, sort of this, how come like fictional characters can inspire people in a sort of uh, emotional sense, and they often do, right? They're fantastic for that. But they, um, they're not useful for proper development of competency. 
I understand that's superior, but does that sort of personal judgment involved with people you can't be corrected by make emulation much less valuable? Well, no. And so this is this is where, um, so I, I don't want to get too far into this because then we're just going to be talking about what we're going to be talking about on the last day. But ultimately, the master teacher relationship can only be had by a master who is immediate and present. And uh, in, in many ways, you know, there is a practical element that a, a living master is, you know, like s someone who's right there that you can emulate and interact with personally. There is practical reasons why this is better than emulating sort of someone from afar, right? But let's say even if we ignore the practical things, there are there still is an, a, a key essential difference that, um, like I said, I'm going to leave it unsaid till Friday. Right? I'm going to leave it unsaid till the fifth lecture, but there is an essential difference that is why I consider the master-student relationship the ultimate synthesis of the three key methods of improvement. The first of which we talked about today, which is emulation. And tomorrow we're going to talk about uh, intellectual study. If someone doesn't have an objective measure of what true mastery is in something they want to emulate, how does someone find good masters? So. That, that's sort of the issue, right? Um, as I said, there, there's really only two things you can do in that case. If it's, if it's an um, activity that does not have objective measurements. Come up, we're, we're like, we talk about games because those have really objective ways of measuring, right? Hey, is this guy a good basketball player? I don't know. Does he win games? Yes. Okay. Well, that at least speaks to his, his excellence. Does he win games at the highest level? Oh, okay. Well, this guy's the 10 billionth time champion of of whatever league, right? I don't I'm sorry. I guess this shows my ignorance. I don't know how basketball is organized, but <laughs> you know, and so you have this sort of situation where, okay, well, this is an objective measurement. He's, my goal is to be good at basketball. To, you know, basketball is about, you know, the ultimate end of the activity of basketball is to win a game. This guy wins a bunch of games, you know, therefore he, ha he has this objective excellence. And so, but a lot of activities don't have that, right? Like one example is politics. And this is why Aristotle just straight says, you know, young people can't do politics. Well, why is that? And he gives two reasons. One, they're out of control of their passions. So their passions are going to make them, you know, and he doesn't just mean like physical passions because people might make the mistake, oh, well, I have control of my, you know, libido or something. But no, he means like even your emotional passions. You get too angry too easily. You, you identify with something too, too strongly. And so you get offended easily, you know, stuff like that what are you going to do? You know, you're just not going to be useful because any opinion you have is going to be radically colored by these passions. And the other reason, and this is sort of the more relevant one, is that um, if, it's an, if it's an activity which doesn't have objective measurements, it tends to be an art rather than a science, which means it's governed by opinions. And there can be true and false opinions, right? I mean, I'm, I'm going to talk about all this tomorrow, funny enough. Um, you know, there's good, but, but ultimately, the way you figure out a true opinion is through good judgment. And how do you have good judgment? Well, you know, you have a lot of practical experience, a lot of practical, the virtue of practical judgment. And that can't, that can't be taught. That simply has to be developed through living a virtuous life. And so necessarily young people, even virtuous young people just don't have that. And so for that, right, this is sort of the miracle of Western civilization is that we have institutions which make a much, as much a science about these arts as, as possibly can. And this is how come in many ways the essence of Western civilization are the Western institutions. Um, we live in a difficult time, though, because a lot of times these institutions, I mean, pretending they've never been subversive is also wrong. They've, they've been subversive since the beginning, right? That Aristotle himself writes about this, right? He calls them sophist or these false schools of philosophy, right? Famously destroying the Pythagoreans, right? Uh, so, so we have to be careful there, but we also can't discount them. You know, even today, right? If you if you're in America, I'm assuming it applies to to Europe too, right? Uh, you know, wherever America goes, the Western Europe, you know, walks arm in arm with us, right? The higher institutions tend to have a lot of problems actually accurately explaining things, accurately delivering authentic information and stuff. And yet, at the end of the day, you would be foolish to to trust someone who goes, "Oh, I'm a self-taught physicist. I'm a self-taught mathematician." It's like it's going to be highly questionable how valuable their opinions are. And so, you know, you would still be foolish to do that, no matter how bad the state of these institutions are. And so those end up becoming the two ways that I mentioned before. How do you find what's the objective? If, if there's no real objective measure of something like, say, politics or history or, or something like that, 
how do you find true mastery? Well, you can either trust the popular institutions, which you should do. There, like I said, it would be it's the wise thing to do. But you temper it with a reluctance that I'm going to accept this. I'm, I'm going to believe this in a sort of cautious way, where I'll believe this. But if if I actually need this information and I, I need it to be authentic, then I'll I'll take steps to um, confirm it in a sort of better way. And then, and so that's sort of that's sort of how you should do that. But then the second way, right, which is something you can't really fix, is just you have to just sort of use your practical judgment in those activities. It, you know, oh, you get older, you get wiser, and then you're sort of better able to figure out who seems to really understand what they're talking about. Are their ideas coherent? You know, do they have a lot of think, stake in this, like in the proper or wrong way? You know, stuff like that. And, and that just comes with time. That can't be explained. That can't be taught. And you just have to develop that through living a life of virtue. That's the important part here. Because Aristotle didn't think time alone grants you practical judgment. And I agree, right? It is that what, what does? It's living life virtually over time grants practical judgment. Yeah, so that, that's the answer there. So when, so when you said, how do you find a good master? Those are really the only two options you have. Sort of cautiously approach the, what we call the popular institutions of the subject. Or to, you know, simply wait and just don't take part in the activity until you can. So, so if you were to ask me, how do I find a true master in politics, right? You can trust the institutions, but that would sort of be a disaster, even cautiously. Or the, the real answer would be, I'm young, I don't have enough practical judgment, so I just shouldn't talk about politics. I shouldn't have an interest in politics because it, it's useless to me right now. And that would be your answer because there's, there's no like, it's not an objective measure, but there's no sort of quantifiable measure of, how do I know this guy knows politics? quote unquote, right? So, so that would be the answer there. Right, yeah. and, and, and any activity which has the same situation would be similar. Um, how do I know who's the good, you know, who's the good historian, who's the good, you know, this? I'm trying to think, like, I, like I'm sure you could come up with a million examples, right? Um, you know, you either sort of trust consensus of, of, the, of the wise, of the elders, or, or like if you don't want to do that, which I totally understand in today's day and age, right? If you don't want to do that, well, you just got to wait. <laughs> you just got to wait and, you know, be interested in something, interested in something else.